Welcome to the Supreme Court in Action. An interactive U.S. history tutorial for students like you. Let's review some things you may already know about the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court sits at the top of the judicial branch, one of the three co-equal branches of government established by the Constitution in 1789. It's no ordinary court. The Supreme Court justices decide cases of constitutional importance. When Americans disagree about what the Constitution means or what rights it guarantees, the Supreme Court has the final say in what is constitutional or legal under the nation's founding document. The court can also declare laws to be unconstitutional or illegal. Every time the court does this, it creates a new legal reality by saying what the law is and is not. In this sense, the court's decisions have the power of laws. Only nine judges called justices serve on the Supreme Court at one time. Justices are appointed by the President of the United States and are confirmed by the Senate, and they serve with no term limits until they retire or die. The Supreme Court typically only hears cases that reach it on appeal. This means that the cases have been argued and decided, often several times by lower courts, but there remains disagreement about their outcomes, so they've been appealed all the way to the nation's highest court for a final decision. When the justices decide a case, majority rules. One justice on the winning side leads the rest of the majority in writing an opinion for the court. A justice in the minority writes a dissent or opposing opinion. The nine justices who serve on the Supreme Court have always been among the most powerful people in the United States because their decisions impact the lives of hundreds of millions of others. But the court today is actually much more powerful than it was at this nation's founding. In 1953, Earl Warren was appointed Chief Justice of the Supreme Court by President Dwight Eisenhower. Chief Justice Warren would lead the court until 1968, and during that 15-year period, he led a liberal majority that used the power of the court in a dramatic fashion. Warren generally believed in using the law as an instrument for achieving fairness and equality in a way the court had not always done in the past. He and the other justices often broke with legal tradition and precedent to bring about change, especially when the rights of women, criminal defendants, and racial minority groups were at stake. The Warren Court played a leading role in expanding civil rights, civil liberties, and the power of the judicial branch to impact American society. Even after Earl Warren left the Supreme Court in 1968, and the more conservative Warren Burger became Chief Justice, the justices of the Burger Court continued Warren's legacy well into the 1970s. The first case we'll look at in detail is one you may have heard of, Brown v. Board of Education of Topeka. It's one of the most famous and significant cases ever decided by the Supreme Court. Before 1954, many U.S. states still had segregated public schools in which black and white students attended separate but equal facilities. This kind of segregation had been legally allowed under an earlier Supreme Court decision from 1896, Plessy v. Ferguson. The red states you see on this map include all the southern states. These states required school segregation by law. The states in green forbid school segregation by law. Other states, including Kansas, allowed segregation but didn't require it. In Topeka, Kansas, African-American third grader Linda Brown had to attend a school for black children a mile away from her home instead of the school for white children several blocks away. Her father, Oliver Brown, believed that this was unjust and sued the city school board, along with several other Topeka parents. Their cases were combined into a class action lawsuit that became known as Brown v. Board. The case was appealed to the Supreme Court, which issued its ruling in 1954. In a unanimous decision led by Chief Justice Earl Warren, the court decided that school segregation laws were unconstitutional and illegal. Even if the separate schools were truly equal in every respect, the justices said that the act of segregation by itself caused social and psychological damage and violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. As a result of the Brown decision, school districts across the nation were ordered to desegregate their schools as soon as possible. There was resistance to the court's decision, especially in the South. It would be years before some school districts complied, and as you will see in the next case, even when some districts attempted to desegregate, they found it was easier said than done. More than 10 years after Brown v. Board, public schools in the South were still highly segregated. One such school district was in Mecklenburg County, North Carolina, which included Charlotte and its surrounding communities. 
In the late 1960s, although the district had made an effort to desegregate schools, most remained almost all white or all black because of geography. Most African Americans lived in the city of Charlotte, while most white students lived in the suburbs outside the city, so that even when students attended their neighborhood schools, they wound up segregated by race. Of 24,000 black students, for example, more than half still attended schools that were 99% or more African American. The NAACP brought a lawsuit on behalf of six-year-old student James Swan to force the district to do better. A federal district court came up with a plan that called for the busing of some black students from the city to the suburbs and some white students from the suburbs to the city to achieve greater integration, the opposite of segregation. The school district adopted the plan, but said that it was unreasonable and continued to fight the matter in court. The case of Swan v. Charlotte Mecklenburg Board of Education was appealed to the Supreme Court. In 1971, Chief Justice Warren Burger led a unanimous but complicated decision that upheld busing as a tool for speeding up the racial integration of schools. Even if some students were inconvenienced by long bus rides, it was necessary to achieve a worthy goal for society. The court noted that because busing students to certain schools had once been a tool used to achieve segregation before Brown v. Board, it could now be used in order to desegregate schools. As a result of the court's decision, many large cities and school districts began busing in order to achieve greater integration. This continued well into the 1990s. In 1999, mandatory busing ended in Charlotte, which was by then considered a fully integrated school system. Another Supreme Court decision, Regents of the University of California v. Backey, dealt with race and education, this time on the college level. In the early 1970s, the medical school at the University of California, Davis, wanted to increase the enrollment of minority students and those who came from less privileged backgrounds. In order to arrive at a more diverse student body, the medical school reserved 16 of 100 spots in each incoming class for minority students or those who were economically disadvantaged. This practice is widely known as affirmative action or positive discrimination. It's a policy of giving favored treatment to disadvantaged groups, especially those who have historically suffered from negative discrimination or racism. Alan Backey was a white male who applied to the medical school and was rejected twice. He pointed out that minority students with lower grades and test scores had been admitted instead of him, and he sued the university for excluding him based on his race. The state Supreme Court of California ruled against the university and said that its race-based admissions policy was unconstitutional, but the case was appealed to the Supreme Court. The court's 1978 decision was complicated. Justice Lewis Powell led a 5-4 to four decision requiring the University of California, Davis, to admit Allen Backey to its medical program. Powell said that any admission system that establishes a quota or a specific number of spaces set aside for a certain ethnic or racial group was unconstitutional, no matter what good intentions may lie behind it. Four other justices agreed with him on this issue. But Powell issued another part to his opinion stating that institutions like universities could take race into account when deciding their admissions as long as it was one of several factors taken into consideration. Four different justices agreed with him on this issue. Basically, the court ruled that affirmative action in education was legal, but specific racial quotas were not. Universities today take these factors into account when admitting outstanding students from diverse backgrounds. In the 1960s, the Warren Court issued a series of decisions that protected the rights of defendants, Americans accused of crimes. Mapp v. Ohio was one of these cases. Dal Ray Mapp lived in Cleveland, Ohio. Local police received a tip that a suspect wanted in a bombing might be hiding in her home. Mapp refused to admit the police into her house without a search warrant, but the police soon returned, forced their entry, and showed her a piece of paper they claimed was a warrant. They would not allow her to read it and handcuffed her for being belligerent. The bombing suspect was found in the building, and police also seized materials they believed linked Mapp to illegal activities. Dal Ray Mapp was arrested and found guilty, but she appealed the decision on the grounds that the search of her property was illegal and had been conducted without a true search warrant. Because the Fourth Amendment to the Bill of Rights protects Americans from unreasonable search and seizure, the Supreme Court heard Mapp's case on appeal. The central question for the court was this. If an illegal search yields legitimate evidence of a crime, can the evidence still be used in court? In a 6-3 decision led by Justice Tom Clark, the Supreme Court ruled that it could not by deciding in favor of MAP.
If a search was conducted illegally in violation of the Fourth Amendment, evidence obtained in that search cannot be used in federal or state courts, even if it meant that a possibly guilty person might go free. As a result of this decision, police everywhere had to be much more careful that the searches they conducted were lawful, with genuine search warrants. Some complained, about this decision and others of the Warren Court, that it was now too hard for police to do their jobs and catch criminals. But the justices were concerned with the rights of all Americans, including those who might one day find themselves in conflict with the law. Gideon v. Wainwright was another decision that protected the rights of the accused. Clarence Gideon was arrested in Florida for breaking and entering and theft in 1961. Gideon was a drifter with little money to his name and couldn't hire a lawyer, so he asked the judge in his case to appoint one for him. The Sixth Amendment of the Bill of Rights guarantees that a criminal defendant has the right to the assistance of counsel or a lawyer for his defense. The judge denied Gideon's request, saying that while the defendant had the right to a lawyer, the state of Florida did not have to pay for one. So Gideon, who had quit school after the eighth grade, had to serve as his own lawyer. Not surprisingly, he lost and was found guilty. But from his prison cell, Gideon sued the Florida Department of Corrections and its secretary, Louis Wainwright. He lost, but the Supreme Court agreed to hear his case on appeal and assign him a lawyer. In its decision, the court, led by Justice Hugo Black, decided unanimously in favor of Gideon. The right to legal representation was a fundamental American right essential for a fair trial and due process of law, Black said. If a defendant could not afford a lawyer, one must be appointed at no charge. As a result of Gideon v. Wainwright, about 2,000 individuals in Florida had their convictions overturned because they, like Gideon, had not been able to afford lawyers. Florida and other states now required public defenders, lawyers who work for the state to represent defendants in need. Gideon himself was not directly set free, but he was entitled to a new trial, this time with a court-appointed lawyer, and he was found not guilty. One of the most controversial cases decided by the Warren Court was Miranda v. Arizona. Ernesto Miranda of Phoenix, Arizona was arrested for a horrible crime, the kidnapping and assault of a young woman. The victim identified him in a police lineup. Miranda was interrogated by police, and he signed a written confession to the crime. He did not request a lawyer. But at no time during the interrogation was the suspect specifically informed of his Fifth Amendment right to a lawyer, nor was he informed that he had the right to remain silent, not to say anything to police that might incriminate him or make him appear guilty. At his trial, Miranda's lawyer argued that because his client was unaware of his rights, his confession was invalid and should be inadmissible as evidence. The judge disagreed and Miranda was found guilty. But Miranda's case was appealed all the way to the Supreme Court. The court ruled narrowly in favor of Miranda in a 5-4 to four decision. Chief Justice Earl Warren spoke for the court, explaining that the Constitution's protection against self-incrimination was a fundamental right. However, police cannot assume that individuals know their rights, so suspects must be informed of them directly and warned that what they say may incriminate them. Only when a suspect acknowledges and waives these rights can a confession be considered legal evidence. As a result of this controversial ruling, Miranda's conviction was overturned and he was set free. He was, however, retried using different evidence and found guilty again. Following the decision, the nation's police departments required officers to read to suspects, at the time of their arrest, the words that have become known as their Miranda rights. You probably recognize the words from movies or TV shows you've seen. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say or do can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to an attorney. If you cannot afford an attorney, one will be appointed to you. Suspects must acknowledge that they have been read their rights before an interrogation can proceed. The Supreme Court also ruled on issues of women's reproductive rights in the 1960s and 70s, a period when feminism was on the rise. One such case was Griswold v. Connecticut. Until the 1960s, it was illegal in Connecticut to use any drug or instrument for the purpose of preventing conception, in other words, to legally practice birth control. The Connecticut Comstock Law that made this illegal dated back to 1879, a very different era. In 1960, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration approved the oral contraceptive most people simply call the birth control pill. At that time, Connecticut was one of only two states to still have a state law on the books making its use illegal. 
To challenge this law, Estelle Griswold, executive director of the Planned Parenthood League of Connecticut, opened a birth control clinic. She was arrested and fined. Griswold appealed her conviction, and the case was eventually decided by the Supreme Court. In 1965, the court ruled 7-2 to two in favor of Griswold, explaining that state bans on birth control violated the Constitution and the right to marital privacy. In his opinion for the court, Justice William Douglas explained that the civil rights specifically mentioned in the Constitution amount to a fundamental right to privacy, especially when it comes to married couples. This was the first time the Supreme Court identified this right. Not all the justices agreed, but the decision made an important precedent for other cases in the future, especially those like Roe v. Wade that also concerned women's reproductive rights. As a result of this decision, state laws banning the use of birth control were declared unconstitutional. It's worth noting that Griswold v. Connecticut technically only applied at the time to married women. In other decisions in 1972 and 1973, the court would extend this protection to unmarried couples and to all women in general. Abortion. The decision of a mother to terminate her pregnancy is one of the most controversial topics in American society. In Roe v. Wade, the Supreme Court attempted to settle the issue. Historically, most states had strict laws that banned abortion except for situations where the mother's life was in danger. But that changed in the 1960s and beyond, when some states relaxed their abortion restrictions while other states did not. The result was a very inconsistent national policy. Some women lived in a state or could afford to travel to one where abortion was legal. Other women could not. Jane Roe, not her real name, was unmarried and pregnant in 1970. She lived in Texas, a state that still outlawed abortion. Roe filed a lawsuit against Henry Wade, the district attorney representing Texas, claiming that her state's law violated the 14th Amendment's guarantee of equal protection of the laws, as well as a woman's right to privacy that the Supreme Court had identified several years earlier in Griswold v. Connecticut. The Supreme Court agreed to hear the case of Roe v. Wade. In 1973, years after Jane Roe had already given birth, the court ruled 7-2 to two in her favor. Justice Harry Blackman spoke for the justices, explaining that the constitutional right to privacy did protect a woman's right to an abortion, at least in the first three months of her pregnancy. In the later trimesters of pregnancy, Blackman explained that the state's interest in the unborn child became more compelling, and states were allowed to regulate and even ban abortion at the later stages. As a result of the decision, abortion became legal across the entire United States. This remains the case today. More than 40 years have passed since the Roe v. Wade decision, easily one of the most controversial rulings in the Supreme Court's history. Abortion remains legal, but Americans still continue to debate its morality. In this tutorial, you've learned about eight landmark Supreme Court cases in some detail. We hope it's been educational. By now, you probably realize how the decisions of the court affect all Americans, not just the individuals involved in the cases. Because the decisions of the Supreme Court justices have the force of law, each case they decide can create a new legal reality for Americans. The Supreme Court today, led by Chief Justice John Roberts, has changed politically. While Earl Warren famously led a majority of liberal justices starting in the 1950s, the Roberts Court today tends to be more conservative. But the decisions of the court continue to have great impact on American society. Americans still look to the nine men and women of the Supreme Court for their final decisions on some of the most important issues of our time, including health care, gun control, same-sex marriage, money and politics, and many more. That is the real legacy of Earl Warren and the other Supreme Court justices who served in the 1950s, 1960s, and 1970s.